lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma are like what I call the big three, right? Those are the most aggressive, and our detection rate in dogs with one of those three cancers was 85%. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Hello, friend. Today on Dog Cancer Answers, we're investigating Onco K9. It's a liquid biopsy that detects cancer early in a simple blood draw, basically the stuff of science fiction. The test is made by PetDX and their chief medical oncologist, Dr. Andy Flory, is joining us today to talk about this really interesting testing technology and what it promises for our dogs. Dr. Andy Flory, thank you so much for joining us today. Lovely to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So when I first heard about this new test, I thought it was science fiction. I'll be just completely honest with you. It sounds like the future is bright. It sounds like those movies they made for like the World's Fair in in the 60s. Like in the future, we're going to have flying cars and a blood test that detects cancer early. (laughs) Like, are we there? Are we in the future? Is this science fiction? That's a great question. I mean, it it really is science fiction, isn't it? It's like, how can this possibly be that you can detect cancer with just a blood test? And it's funny because as veterinarians, it is a very common question that we get. Can't you just tell if my dog has cancer from a blood test or from the blood work that you did? So we're kind of very used to this, to talking about this. And we've talked about it for so long and had to say, that doesn't exist. Like there's no such thing as a blood test for cancer. So that's kind of the preface is like most veterinarians have had that conversation with families. And, you know, when you first hear this word liquid biopsy, I think it it conjures up all these like possibilities. You're like, wow, if you could really diagnose and detect and understand a patient's disease better with just a blood draw, that would be practice changing. And so, you know, going through the clinical study that we performed, which was in 1,100 dogs with and without cancer, so just a a really, really large study, and seeing all these cases of the ability to detect multiple types of cancer, so 30 types of cancer with just a blood draw, I mean, it really, it sounds like science fiction, but it's actually true. So I would say, yeah, the future is here. In our Facebook group for people whose dogs have cancer, probably every other day there is a sort of general despairing post from somebody who says, I just don't understand why there isn't just a test that could have told me. Because if I'd known earlier, I would have taken action. And that's the promise of Onco K9. And um, I would like you to just tell me a little bit about exactly what is going on in the body. How is the test administered? What is it looking for? How long does it take to get results back? And then what are the things that people need to do afterwards? Also, I really want to know what cancers you can reliably detect. So let's just talk a little bit about the test itself. Yeah. So what this test is looking for are little bits of DNA. And this is these little fragments of DNA circulate in the blood and they circulate outside of any cell. And so it's called cell-free DNA. Okay. So cell-free DNA, there's a constant source of it in the body because it comes from cells as they die and they release their DNA into the blood. And so it's there's just a constant source of this because there's constant cell death happening in the body from normal cells. That's apoptosis. And that's apoptosis, exactly. But also from cancer cells. And so the subset of cell-free DNA that comes from tumor cells we call circulating tumor DNA or CT DNA. Okay. And that's what this test is looking for. So the technology that makes this possible is a technology called next-generation sequencing, which the way I like to explain this is if you think about a dog's DNA, the entire set of instructions in all of their DNA, that's called the genome. And the genome is present in every single cell in the body apart from some red blood cells. That DNA, if you kind of lay that end to end, that's the genome. And if we think about the way that next generation sequencing works, you're basically taking these little fragments of DNA and you're figuring out almost like the little pieces of paper that come out of a paper shredder where did this fragment come from? How does it fit into this puzzle? 
And then you look at the whole puzzle and you say, do I see in here a cancer signal? And a cancer signal is essentially spelling errors in the DNA that shouldn't be there. Hmm. And these spelling errors can be really, really small. It can just be a single letter that's misspelled. But if it happens in an exact right place that we know is associated with cancer, then that can lead to cancer. Or it can be very, very big changes that affect very large stretches of the genome. And so we look by multiple different methods at the patient's genome, and we determine then whether a cancer signal is present in that patient's sample. Now, these little fragments of DNA, they have to, they are very short-lived in the body. They only last for minutes to hours. So we have to stabilize them with a special blood collection tube that stabilizes the sample. And so you asked about how the test is performed. The test is performed like any other blood draw, like a patient would have for any routine lab work that they have performed, Mm -hmm. but it's pulled into two of these special blood collection tubes. And the volume's a little bit bigger than your typical kind of lab top machine type of test that would be run at your veterinarian. Because it's like it's like doing a biopsy, right? Just like a biopsy is a relatively larger piece of tissue than you would do if you were doing an aspirate, for example, where you're just taking a few cells out. A biopsy of the blood is no different. We need a little bit more because we're looking for this DNA that's present at very, very, very tiny quantities. So how much blood is being taken? It's about one tablespoon. A tablespoon, okay. Yeah. When we put it into like baking concepts, it really doesn't sound like a lot. And that is actually a safe amount to draw in the vast majority of patients that we see down to about a five pound dog. Okay. Because my dog's eight pounds. So a tablespoon of blood to me (laughs) sounds like like more than it would to someone who has a great Dane. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Right. right. Okay. So I want to make sure I understand this. You're taking these large for veterinary medicine generally, but small for, you know, our imagination, we don't have to worry about it, blood draws. Yeah. You're taking a lot of blood out for your purposes because you want to see how many, as many little bits of DNA that are circulating as possible. They're stabilized so they don't change, they don't disintegrate on the way to the lab. And then when they're at the lab, you look at, are you getting the cells, the genome of the dog? Are you getting that from those the circulating DNA from the free DNA that you're getting in the sample? Yeah, we're sequencing the DNA that's in the sample. That's in the sample. Okay. Yeah. And then some of the DNA sequences that you see will not sort of, you won't be able to match them along the sequence. You'll say, "Eh, this is the same as right here, but it's just a little bit off or, wow, this looks like this section, but a lot of changes have been made. And that's basically a cancer signal. That's right. So we match it to a canine genome. So just like in humans, the canine genome has been sequenced. We know what the normal sequence is, and then we can compare and say what is abnormal. That's right. Okay. I see. So this is getting, obviously, the DNA fragments of normal cells that have undergone apoptosis and are just leaving the body because it's their time to go. There's DNA samples from that. Those will look and they'll fit easily into that canine genome that has already been sequenced that you guys have as sort of your, this is what the perfect puzzle picture looks like. And here's where this piece of it is. And then the cancer DNA will not quite fit along that puzzle. It's like the puzzle piece, it should be there, but like a corner's missing or there's an extra little corner on it or something. Okay. Or there's more. There's like, you know, 20 puzzle pieces where there should just be one. That's not normal, right? You shouldn't have that. Right. That is not normal. Yep. That's when you call the puzzle company and say, <laughs> "I clearly something's wrong here. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Well, that is fascinating. And so you said that there's a stabilizing agent. Does that mean, does this have to be refrigerated on its way to the lab or do we have to worry about that? when the sample goes off? No, actually. What's so fascinating about these tubes is that they stabilize the sample for seven days at room temperature. So no refrigeration, no freezing. You don't have to spin the sample in busy veterinary clinics. You don't have to kind of hunt down like a styrofoam box and an ice pack and all of the things. You just pop it back in the box and then send it. So does the veterinarian order this test? Yeah. So it's by prescription only through a licensed veterinarian. So it does need to be ordered by and drawn by and submitted by a veterinarian. Okay. Are there veterinarians who, if I bring my dog to their clinic, will say, 
oh, you're here for your wellness check, but your dog's eight. And now I think maybe we should add this in. Do you want to do it? I've got the box right here. Yes. Is that happening right now? Or do they have to make a call? Yeah, so that's happening now. And it's my dream that that would happen everywhere, right? So that we could give so many more dogs the opportunity to have this test and find cancer earlier. So the way to sort of find out if there is a clinic in your area that is offering the test, there's really a few ways. One is that you can go to our website at PetDX.com and go to the Pet Parents page and you'll find a clinic locator. Okay. And you can find out who is offering the test. But the test is actually also available through our major veterinary diagnostic distributors like IDEX and Antec. And these are very common diagnostic companies that most veterinarians use. So even if they're not aware of it yet, they can order the kits to do this test, most likely because most of them are using one of those diagnostic companies. Wonderful. And generally, when a test is available through a diagnostic company, that reassures a lot of the skepticism that a veterinarian feels because they know that that distributor has vetted and the company has vetted that test on their level and feel like it's worth offering and keeping in stock and that they assume it'll be needed at some point. Otherwise, they wouldn't keep it. Absolutely. Well, that's wonderful. So even if your veterinarian doesn't have it in stock, usually those distributors get things to them like within a week, but often the next day. Yeah. All right. So it's really possible to get this pretty quickly and reliably. And then the testing, how long does that take? Yeah, the turnaround time is usually between about 10 and 12 days from the time the sample is received at the lab, but sometimes it's faster than that. So it could be about a week, but the turnaround most of the time is between 10 and 12 days. And that's calendar days. Calendar days, not business days. Okay. Not business days, yes. Well, that's nice. Mm -hmm. So what are the kinds of cancer that you feel confident are reliably being picked up on? So in our study, we were able to detect 30 types of cancer. So this is really a multi-cancer test. Wow. And we we broke it down to look at cohorts of like, what are the most common cancers that veterinarians see, diagnose, and manage? Lymphoma, mm -hmm. hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma are like what I call the big three. Yeah. Those are the most aggressive. And our detection rate in dogs with one of those three cancers was 85%. Okay. So really, really phenomenal that the test could pick up 85% of those very, very aggressive cancers. Now, if we add to that another five cancers, which rounds out the top eight most common cancers that dogs get. So adding to that, soft tissue sarcoma, mast cell tumor, mammary gland carcinoma, malignant melanoma, and anal sac carcinoma, those are the top eight most common cancers. So, so those five in addition to the lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma. And the detection rate in that group was 62%. Wow. So really when you consider all of the most common cancers that dogs get, the test is able to pick out the majority of them. And this is earlier than probably you would you're picking these things up before the dog gets sick, basically. We can. From my perspective as a dog owner, it's when my dog starts to feel sick that I start to worry about things like cancer. Before my dog gets sick, I'm not worried about things like dog cancer. Well, I am now because I've had dogs with cancer, but most people who haven't yet had to deal with this don't. And cancer just sideswipes them. And to know that you're picking it up, but your dog's not sick yet, I think would take a tremendous amount of You'd still have plenty of anxiety and trauma to deal with on an emotional level, but it would, in fact, lower your trauma a little bit to know that you caught it early. Absolutely, because I think there's more benefits to finding it early than just what some of the things that we've talked about so far, like that the patient, the dog is feeling better, so they have a better, like they're starting from a better place. They're stronger. They can tolerate. But there's other benefits, yeah, like from, from a family's point of view, you have more options to consider if your dog is diagnosed when they're feeling healthy versus, you know, when they're feeling sick. So the most common example that I like to give here is anyone that's been through hemangiosarcoma diagnosis with their dog, unfortunately knows that most of those dogs are diagnosed because their tumor is bleeding. Right. And they end up in the emergency room or they end up at their vet very, very sick because they've lost a lot of blood. And by that point, the cancer is pretty advanced. Right. And so, you know, being able to detect it before it even causes any bleeding means that the family has more options to choose from. Like they're not 
sort of forced into this sometimes middle of the night urgent decision that's happening at the ER clinic of, you know, here's what has to happen. Like you have to do this right now, basically to, and there's really no other, there's no other options right now in the middle of the night. You know, we have to consider a blood transfusion or immediate surgery or both. And so it it kind of puts you in that position of being able to have more choices really and have the time really to choose what is best for your dog and for your family. Right. So if I get, let's say that in this hypothetical where I have a dog, I've gone in for a wellness check, the vet says, you know, I have a Maltese. I'll say, you you know, your little girl's, she's 10. This is when we start to think that maybe it's, you know, she's getting older and her risk of cancer has gone up one out of two dogs over the age of 10, typically. That's about roughly half over the age of 10 will get cancer. And so there's this test. We could do it. We might find something. We might not. If we find something, we can do follow-up tests, right? This is not an actual diagnosis. This is a test that could lead to a diagnosis. Am I correct about this? You are. And that's a really good point to bring up. So this is a screening test. It's not a diagnostic. And what that really means is that we as veterinarians won't make important decisions like treatment or euthanasia just on the basis of a test like this alone. It's really, it's a piece of the puzzle. But it's not the whole picture, right? You really have to then pursue further testing to understand exactly what is going on and to get a definitive answer and diagnosis on what's happening. Right. Okay. Do you have general guidelines on when you would recommend this be used for dogs who are otherwise healthy? Yeah. So we recommend it as an annual screening test for all dogs over the age of seven. Okay. And... Because there are some breeds that tend to, if they get cancer, or even if they're at high risk of cancer, they can get it earlier in life. Mm -hmm. Some dogs should start as young as the age of four. Are Rottweilers in that category? Rottweilers are a breed that is at high risk of developing cancer sort of in their lifetime. Yeah. If you have a question about any particular breed, We put together a study where we looked at about 3,400 dogs with cancer and determined by breed what's the average age that they developed cancer. And we use that to make a recommendation for when should a particular individual start cancer screening. And so we have a tool on our website called the Cancer Safe Tool, which stands for Screening Age for Early Detection. And that's cancersafe.petdx.com. Okay. And you can go on there and you can put in your pet or for veterinarians listening, your patient's information, their breed, their age, and their weight, and determine in this particular dog, when should I consider starting cancer screening? Wonderful. That's a good place for us to stop and take a quick break. And then we'll come back with Dr. Flory and we'll talk a little bit about the competition out there. Every meal you give your dog is an opportunity to support vibrant health and even fight cancer. The Dog Cancer Diet is a set of guidelines that Dr. Dressler created for his book, The Dog Cancer Survival Guide. And every ingredient is either supporting the body with dense nutrition or helping your dog's cells to fight cancer. And in some cases, both. You can help your dog at every meal. Even if you can't do a home-cooked diet, using just elements from the diet is a great way to help your dog every day. Is diet the only way to treat dog cancer? Of course not. Dr. Damian Dressler and Dr. Susan Ettinger, also known as Dr. Sue, cancer vet, talk a lot about treatments in their best-selling book. Diet is just one of five important steps to take when you're planning your dog's cancer treatment. Check out the diet tips and the rest of the steps in what readers call the Bible of Dog Cancer, the Dog Cancer Survival Guide. You can find it wherever you find fine books or at dogcancerbook.com. And we're back with Dr. Flory, and we're talking about Onco K9, a liquid biopsy test. Is there anybody else who's doing something like this, or how does it compare to other people who are doing these early cancer detection tests? Um, So there really aren't any competitors in the veterinary space. This is really the only multi-cancer early detection or MSED test. It's the only next-generation sequencing-based liquid biopsy that's available for dogs that can detect a wide variety of cancers. 
There are other blood-based cancer tests, but they're very different in terms of technology and what they look for and the clinical use of those. So that's pretty different from what this test is looking for. Okay. So you're really looking at the genome. That's right. And you're really looking at the DNA. That's right. Okay. And that's why we're saying liquid biopsy. Yeah. That's a great marketing term. Yeah. I wish we made it up, but we did not. That came, that came from the human side. It's a great, it's okay. a great, isn't it? it? Just what it conjures it up. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Is this test covered by pet insurance companies? The insurance companies that we've talked to so far, most of them do not seem to be covering it for the screening use. So, in a dog where cancer is not suspected. Okay. But another use for this test that veterinarians are using it for is as an aid in diagnosis. And what that really means is, okay, you have a patient that has clinical signs or something in their, in their clinical presentation that makes you suspect cancer in this individual. But it's kind of challenging to diagnose. Either you kind of can't get to that part of the body easily or you know, it's going to require some sort of advanced testing that you don't have in your clinic, something like that. So this is a test that can determine is cancer signal present in this patient. Mm -hmm. And so for that use, where the veterinarian suspects cancer, it seems that some insurance companies are actually covering that part of it. I see. That's helpful. I was just last December our little dog has been fighting cancer for four years. Oh my gosh. She's amazing. She's 14 and a half. And we brought her in, I thought for back pain, but we also saw that there was a widespread masses in her abdomen that in order for us to understand biop, you know, to biopsy, we'd have to open her up. And at this age, that's not happening. You know, that's just not what we're doing. So this would have been a really nice thing for us to be able to ask for at the vet clinic to say, hey, can we just do this one test? And then maybe we'll know what we're dealing with. In our case, that would have just given us a piece of information that we wouldn't have necessarily acted upon. Yeah. Sometimes it just helps you understand and sometimes as a family make decisions because, you know, a lot of times if you have these clinically challenging cases where it's like, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this, and and I don't really have a good way to, to answer the question Sometimes it really would help to kind of narrow it down in terms of what you choose for treatment or, mm -hmm. you know, which pathway you go down. Like, do you go to a specialist or do you not or that sort of thing? So right. I think you're right. There's sometimes just these really challenging situations where it can be very helpful to know, to kind of guide the path. She had a diffuse pattern in her liver scan on ultrasound. And basically they were like, well, it's either a liver infection or it's metastasis. And we don't know which. And the only way we found out, we ruled it out by a couple of weeks, giving her some liver support and then retesting and her liver values had gone down even more. So probably metastasis. Mm. <laughs> but this would have actually probably got us closer to knowing that maybe sooner. Yeah. Sometimes it's just that piece of the puzzle, like I said, that kind of makes it kind of come into clearer focus what's, what's happening. Right. And that may or may not be, for me... At this point with this dog, it's not really something that I probably would have chosen to do just because it would only been, a, for my own curiosity, it wouldn't have changed the way I treat it. But I know a lot of people who would have said, I absolutely want to know what that is and I want to know what's going on so that I can organize my thinking around it. Or maybe they're not so, a lot of people don't think about cancer as much as I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you're intimately connected. In every way possible. Okay, so how much does this cost? So the test is sort of available through those three different channels that I mentioned, and it's going to vary a little bit in terms of where the test is coming from. But in general, it's usually 500 or more. Okay. So it just kind of depends on the clinic and, you know, how it's received by the clinic. Right. So obviously the veterinarians are going to be charging around $500 to us. Right. All right. And then possibly more depending on what else is going on there, where they're located and all of their other business decisions that they make as business owners. That's right. And is there any wiggle room there? Is there anything that people can do <laughs> to bring that cost down, if, especially if insurance isn't covering it? Yeah, that's a good question. I will say that we, you know, we currently have a program that helps to fund the workup in the case of a positive test. So if uh, you know, if you receive a cancer signal detected, we actually have a program to help fund 
at least part of the workup to try to find cancer. So oh. that's not an indefinite program, but it is available now. And so that certainly can help financially. So I would, as a client of a veterinarian, I would say, yeah, I want to spend the money on this test because I know that if it's positive, then Pet DX is going to help with the follow-up tests to determine whether there's illness or not. That's right. And you're doing that, I assume, as a business decision because that's interesting, useful information for you about how your test is used in a clinic and what kind of results you're getting. And it helps you to add to your case studies of took the test, got a positive signal, and yes, in fact, there was cancer and this was the outcome. It definitely does that. It gives us lots of case studies to be able to share with veterinarians to help them understand how does this fit into your clinical workflow. But it also helps both pet parents and veterinarians understand the process of what do I do after a positive result right. and how important that process is. Like you mentioned before, it's, it's really important to follow up on a positive test result, right? See where this cancer signal is coming from. And so if veterinarians and pet owners go through this process and kind of can go through it without the burden of the financial discussion as well, it gives everyone just more comfort with the process. And so that then veterinarians can really understand how important and, and the kind of outcomes that come from doing the workup. I see. So how much are you covering those follow-up? Sounds like it's a substantial help. Yeah, it's up to $1,000. Okay. Well, that covers plenty of diagnostics in most veterinary clinics. Yeah. So you said uh, that, you know, find out where the signal is coming from. So you're identifying a specific cancer signal, right? Like, oh, we're picking up osteosarcoma is what you tell the vet. And then they will do scans to see where the bone tumor is or they... So not yet completely. So really, it's a qualitative answer. It's a yes, no. A cancer signal has been detected or there's no cancer signal detected in this sample. I see. However, we are able to predict the cancer signal origin, meaning the cancer type, for some cancers. And so for right now, that's hematological malignancies, lymphoma, and leukemia specifically. Because mm -hmm. those are in the blood. Well, it's not actually because of that. It's because they have a pretty um, specific signal that's very recognizable. Okay. And so the goal is, and we're very optimistic, that we'll be able to add more cancer types as time goes on. Okay. Yeah. But so, so for right now, it's really a yes, no cancer signal or not. But then for that subset of that particular type of cancer, we can also predict what type of cancer it is. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. So that's really good to know. So it's a yes, no. And then the veterinarian would say, all right, we know something's going on. Let's do a thorough workup. Let's do an ultrasound. Let's do an x-ray. Let's start there and see what we can find. And let's take a closer look at the blood work and see what might be in here. That's exactly it. Yep. So we're just kind of go on a hunt and find out, try to find out where could this be coming from. So, you know, find if there are lumps and bumps and enlarged lymph nodes and anything you can see on x-rays or ultrasound or you know, that you can feel in the abdomen or things like that. And then take samples of those things to look and see if you can find cancer somewhere. Okay. And so for a limited time, you guys are helping to subsidize those costs for people. So I'll make sure that that's in the show notes as well. And everything that we've talked about will be linked to in the show notes. Okay. Tell me about something that really surprised you. Like what's a case that you looked at and you said, okay, this is surprising. I am shocked. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, and we're, we see these cases every week where it's screening patients. So patients that are not their veterinarian and their family does not suspect cancer for any reason, mm -hmm. but they're just a higher risk individual. So they're they're at higher risk of cancer because of their age or because of their breed. Uh huh. And so they're running oncocanine as a screening test to try to identify cancer early, and then the ultimate diagnosis of cancer in patients that don't have any clinical signs, so no signs and symptoms yet is really amazing. We had this case a couple of weeks ago of a patient that had the test as a screening test and ultimately kind of fast forward through all the clinical details was diagnosed with a type of lymphoma of the liver. Whoa. Which universally when I see those are really only diagnosed 
because of clinical signs. So signs and symptoms that they stop eating, they're very sick, their liver values on their blood work are, are really high. Often their liver function is abnormal. So they're in liver failure. Those That's how we usually diagnose these cases. So to have a patient like that be diagnosed before any clinical signs or before any changes in the liver values on the blood work, that's just phenomenal because it means that that patient has a chance at a better outcome because they're able to start therapy from a, a place where they're feeling healthy mm -hmm. and their chance at response to treatment is just so much better and their prognosis is better. Well, sure. If we catch things early, then the treatments always have a better chance of success just from that one factor. That is a critical, especially with something like lymphoma, that's incredibly aggressive disease. And so catching it early and starting treatment early would be really, really important. So how did they decide to run this particular family? Did they just ask for it? Did the veterinarian suggest it because of the risk factors of the dog? Or do you know anything about what prompted them to actually run the test? I do, actually. In that particular case, that family had just been through a cancer diagnosis and treatment with their other pet. Yep. And that is such a common question that I get as an oncologist is, what can I do to catch this earlier in my remaining dog, remaining pet, remaining cat, remaining everything? Like mm -hmm. my other family members I'm worried about. So what can I do for them to try to be proactive about if, if they're going to develop it to try to be proactive in finding it? And so it's, you know, families that are already aware of canine cancer, they're absolutely the ones that are asking for this test and, and are really wanting to do this for their dogs. So I've seen this a lot since 2007 when we first started working with people with dogs with cancer, that oftentimes it's the person who loves their dog and wants to help their dog that sort of leads, leads the veterinarian to the new tool or the new test or the new theory. And then the veterinarian investigates it and says, okay, well, if you're open to trying it, let's try it. So this is one of the patient-led sort of driving forces and even being able to treat cancer to the extent that we are today because people have been asking for things that veterinarians might have some hesitancy over because they're new. I love that idea. Yeah. Are you finding that with Oncocanine? Are you, do you have skepticism in vets or are they embracing it? That's such a good question, but I, I love that idea of pet parents being the one that finds new technologies, new treatments, new everything, and kind of presents it to their vet. Because we are definitely finding that with ambassadors like that, that discover our test and read about the science and read about um, the technology and present it to their vet and then kind of get their vet interested. And then their vet contacts us or, or reaches out to us and, and we provide more information. So Absolutely. We find that as a way to spread the word. And that's really the the job. You said it best. I mean, vets are skeptical. We're a skeptical bunch. We're very data-driven people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, vets typically like to be able to look at all the data and make a decision for themselves about a new technology. And so I think everyone's well aware of that, um, pet owners especially. And so, yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing that and that was a big part of the reason that the study that we did, which was performed at 41 sites on four continents and involved 1,100 dogs, is really so compelling because in veterinary medicine, we just don't see studies like that. I mean, the studies that we're used to, especially for diagnostics, are like 17 dogs were used to validate this test and, you know, 19 for this one and 52 for this one. So you know, good for some things, but really a rather small sample size for a lot of the tests that we're used to using. So we really wanted to have a very large set so that it was really kind of uh, very clear when we were seeing, you know, cancer signal versus no cancer signal in this group of dogs with and without cancer and with a wide variety of cancers. That was really important for the development of that study that for these skeptical vets that we would be able to convince them with the data. So, um, so far, vets are really, really excited to read the study. Well, that's good. And you had it independently verified, right? You have a peer-reviewed paper at this point that is looking at it. Yep. It's a peer-reviewed paper published by the Public Library of Science in a journal called PLAS One, and it's the largest clinical validation study ever performed in veterinary cancer diagnostics. Okay. And that's called the Cancer Detection in Dogs or CANDID study. 
candid study. Okay, so we're going to make sure that there are links to that study in the show notes, obviously for our listeners, but we also have a lot of veterinarians who listen to this program. So I know that they'll want to look at that and as part of their data collection efforts. I understand there's a human version of this liquid biopsy test. Yeah, there's a a company called Grail. I'll say that there are a lot of companies out there that are doing blood-based liquid biopsy to do a variety of of things for cancer management in people, whether it's detection or some sort of management of their treatment process. But there is a company that is doing multi-cancer early detection or MSED as well, and that's a company called Grail, and they have a test called Gallery, G-A-L-L-E-R-I. And so this is now available for people. It's recommended for people age 50 and older, particularly with a family history of cancer. Okay. And it can detect 50 types of cancer with a blood draw, which is just phenomenal because the majority of the cancers that it can detect are not cancers where there is a screening paradigm, meaning that most people, the way that they're diagnosed with those cancers is because they develop signs and symptoms by which point we know that a lot of those cancers are going to be in advanced stages and then providing that cure or very long-term control is usually minimal for those advanced stage cancers. Okay, so that kind of gets me into something that I wanted to talk a little bit about, which is sort of the science fiction aspect of this. Knowledge is power. However, is there such a thing as knowing too much? (laughs) Do we really always want to know all of the things that are going on? I mean, my understanding is that at any given moment in the human body or the dog's body, there could be tumors developing that the immune system is detecting, taking care of, and that they never develop into something that we would identify as cancer. But there are actually tumor cells that could be populating Are these tests finding things that are so small and so insignificant that will never develop into something more later? Are we catching them too soon? Do we really want to know what we have or do we want to wait until it's actually, quote, a problem? That's a great question. And I think I have to be honest, when we were first putting together the study, I had the same thought. And I thought, what if all of these dogs are just walking around with tumor DNA in their blood and they have a cancer signal. Like what if, you know, half of all dogs at a certain age are like just, you know, have really, really minuscule amounts of DNA. And we didn't really know what we were going to find. What we end up finding is that the false positive rate, meaning the dogs from the normal dogs cohort that we detected cancer signal in was only 1.5%. Oh, so extremely low. Okay. And we followed those dogs over time and we retested them when we could and we followed them. Some of those, unfortunately, had passed away by the time we were able to kind of do the analysis. And so some of those could have had cancer and might have been like true positives rather than false positives. But the remaining ones, we ended up finding cancer in two of them. And then we kind of followed, it was only about four additional patients that we have been following over time. So a very, very low percentage of false positives. And, you know, that was a relief to me because when you think about a screening test, the number one thing that you don't want to do is just scare a bunch of families, right, by having a a high false positive rate. Right. And so being able to have such a low 1.5% false positive rate is just great because it means that we really can trust these positive results. And just to be absolutely crystal clear, a false positive is when a test comes back positive for an illness and is incorrect, that it turns out it should have been negative. And so if you've got a 1.5 false positive rate, that means that 98.5% of the time, if this test says there's cancer, then when you go and look and you do further testing or imaging, you're going to find it. Kind of, but but not really, because then when we get into statistics and statistical definitions, the number that you're talking about there is called the positive predictive value or PPV. Right. So that is the really important metric when you're thinking about a specific patient. And so if I've gotten a positive result in this patient, how likely is it that I'm going to find cancer? Mm -hmm. And so the PPV rate is very, very high with this test. And our estimated PPV is between about in the high 70s to the high 90s. Okay. So most of the time, 
if you get a positive result, it is because that patient unfortunately does have cancer and it, you know, if we do a workup, we will ultimately find it. Okay. So the PPV is the 70 to 90% rate, which is still, <laughs> if, I, if I knew that the PPV on a test was 70 to 90%, I'd be like, yeah, let's do a scan. Yeah. I mean, for myself as a human with my own position, I would want to follow up and say, yeah. oh, that's a pretty high rate. Let's look for more information. And that's exactly it, is just the importance of following up. So if a positive result is received, then that's where it's really important to find out where is this signal coming from in the body and look for it. Yep. Okay. That's a good place to take a break. And when we come back, I want to hear a story that you were telling me during our last break about how you started Pet DX. We'll be right back with Dr. Andy Flory. Whether you need a shoulder to cry on, or a pile of sand to pound, or someone to read all of your confused thoughts, our dog cancer support group on Facebook is the place to be. Most members join because their own dogs have cancer and they're reading the Dog Cancer Survival Guide. They read, they write, they cry, they laugh, and they support each other in the group. They share their successes and hold each other when they're down. And even if their dogs are gone, many members stay to offer hard-won wisdom and non-dogmatic advice and empathy to new members. Whether this is your first encounter with dog cancer or your 10th, this is the best support group to join and it is free. Just go to dogcancersupport.com or search for the group called Dog Cancer Support in Facebook. And we're back with Dr. Andy Flory. So Dr. Flory, you were going to tell me about how you started Pet DX. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, so I'm a veterinary medical oncologist and I had a little patient. Her name was Poppy. She was a little eight pound mixed breed dog. She was so adorable. She had these big fluffy ears, almost like a papillon kind of ears, just just adorable. And her family was obviously smitten with her as everyone was when they saw her. So <laughs> Poppy, unfortunately, like a lot of patients that I see, her cancer was found because of clinical signs. And by the time they kind of figured out what was going on with her, her cancer was just everywhere. It was just widespread. And so, you know, to have to share that discussion with the family that is so smitten with their tiny little dog who they've just fallen in love with. It's their first dog too. Oh, no. That, you know, there are always things that we can do to keep her comfortable for as long as we can, but this isn't something we're unfortunately going to be able to cure or control in the long term. Mm -hmm. It's a hard discussion to have. It's kind of a devastating feeling. As I kind of went through the process of getting to know Poppy's family, I found out that Poppy's dad is an MD by training and that his expertise is in genomics and liquid biopsy. And he developed this technology on the human side. And for him, it just really immediately clicked. He was like, you know, I didn't have the opportunity, but we could have detected cancer earlier in my dog. And I want to do this for other people. Like I have this expertise and I know teams that can do this because I've done this on the human side. You know, can we do this for dogs? And he asked me, do you think that this is, is needed, is desired in veterinary medicine? It's like, are you kidding? I've been asked for years whether there's a blood test for cancer. Like, yes, we need this right now. Yeah. So we co-founded PetDX in 2019. And that was really it with the goal of earlier cancer detection in dogs. That's amazing. So that's the human test that is and the inspiration for Onco K9. Right. And that whole the technology on the human side with the next generation sequencing and cell-free DNA-based testing on the human side, it was initially developed for pregnancy for non-invasive prenatal testing, hmm. which again, we were talking earlier about sounding like science fiction. When I was pregnant with my first child and I was offered that test, I was like, this sounds like science fiction. You can take my blood and determine if there are chromosomal abnormalities in my baby. I mean, that that sounds like science fiction, but that's where this technology originated was for use in pregnant women, which is has been used in millions and millions of women at this point. Amazing. I think that genetic testing 
it is science fiction. <laughs> and it is, I really believe, the future of medicine that we are going to have a very personalized approach to diagnostics and also treatment. Yeah. And we're lucky yeah. that there are people who are focusing on this and really taking it and creating these tools. Yeah. It's really exciting. Is there anything else that you feel like our listeners really need to know about Onco K9 or Pet DX in general? I mean, I would say that we know that cancer is the leading cause of death in dogs. Mm -hmm. And we know that most cases are detected because of clinical signs, by which point cancer is typically pretty advanced. And if we can shift that paradigm and shift when that cancer diagnosis happens to earlier, there are just so many benefits for veterinarians, pet parents, for the dogs. And so the thinking, it's, it's a mind shift thinking, right, of thinking about cancer while your dog is still healthy. It's a shift in mindset for, for pet parents as well as veterinarians, right? And so that's what I would say is so exciting to think about what this could mean for cancer outcomes for our patients if we can just shift when that diagnosis happens to earlier. Right, to earlier when they're, they're feeling better, they're feeling healthier, they tolerate treatments better. You can improve their diet and their lifestyle and all the other things that we know that support a healthy body that is better able to fight cancer and obviously all of the other diseases that dogs can get. But cancer is the number one killer of dogs. And I think that a lot of dog lovers only find that out when their dog gets cancer. I know. And it's so sad, right? Because you're, you know, for, for so many people, it's just not on their radar yet. So programs like yours are just so important to get the word out and get the message out so that, you know, every patient that we detect earlier is just, it just makes my heart sing because it's like, think about just the, the impact on that whole family. It's just, it's really amazing. I get emotional. <laughs> yeah, no. My heart dog is in her elder years and we're doing, you know, we're basically in hospice stage and every single day is just a blessing for me. It is. Because she's still with me. Yep. And that's why I became an oncologist because the impact of just every single day that you get to look at your dog and spend with your dog and they wag their tail at you is just, it's such a gift. It is. So given that, and that may be the answer to my last question, but what is the one thing you really wish people would know about their dogs or about their dog's cancer diagnosis from your hard-won experience? I would say that, you know, I think that everyone that goes through a cancer diagnosis always has questions about what could I have done differently and I think that that's a very, very common question that I get. And so if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably going to have dogs in the future, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you're already going through cancer diagnosis right now with a pet, uh, you have probably other dogs or you will in the future. And so this just means that you have an opportunity of something that we now can do, which is just, it's so exciting to think about how this could change things. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, Dr. Andy Flory, thank you so much for joining us here on Dog Cancer Answers. Covered a lot of ground, and I'm really excited about having you on as a guest. I hope you'll come back in the future. Thank you. I would love to. This is fantastic. Thank you for having me. And thank you, listener, for joining us today on this kind of futuristic sci-fi edition of Dog Cancer Answers. I don't know about you, but... A simple blood draw to detect cancer early when my dog is still feeling healthy and acting healthy and by all clinical signs is healthy is exciting. I like the idea of early detection so that we have more options and more time to deal with the number one killer of dogs. And remember, it is not a diagnosis. It is simply a screening test. It says yes or no. So if it's a yes, is it worth following up and seeing if there really is cancer? Uh-huh, absolutely. That it can reliably predict the presence of cancer in the eight most common cancers is pretty powerful. So it's definitely worth asking your veterinarian about and seeing if it might be appropriate for your dog, your healthy dog. I'm looking forward to following up with Dr. Flory and Pet DX as they get more information in the coming months and years. Remember to follow us on the socials and 
please, if you're on Facebook, join our dog cancer support group. It is the best place on the internet for people whose dogs have cancer. You're gonna find people who are non-dogmatic, non-judgmental, and endlessly supportive. I'm Molly Jacobson, and from all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I am wishing you and your dog a very warm aloha. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcanceranswers.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network.